Hello, today my presentation is on Valve and Valve Tabber. And thank you very much for the invitation to speak at the CCC. Here are my disclosures. So we recently published a review article on TAVI in Degenerative Surgical Valve or TAV in SAP. And I encourage you to read this because it offers a nice comprehensive review of this topic. And you can see that here with patient selection, procedural planning and the procedure are highly important in terms of determine the feasibility and the technique associated with TAVR in SABR. So how do we distinguish structural valve deterioration versus prosthesis patient mismatch in terms of whether TAVR in SABR will be beneficial? You can see that here. With PPM ten, tend to on TE look at the valve is actually structurally normal. However, you can see the EOA is also could be normal and also the UA it will be greater than one centimeter with a DVI of 0.25 to 0.34. So let me give you a couple of examples. This is a 73 year old obese fem uh, female, pie AVL of 90 millimeter trifecta, very small valve, very minimally invasive approach. You can see that here. Uh, the question is that with the high gradient, mean gradient of 72, is it degeneration? or prosthesis patient mismatch with this trifecta valve. And the, also the question is, is this patient low surgical risk? She should be having a reoperation with root enlargement. So you can see that there are scenarios where redo salva would be favored. So example, in low risk patients, in younger patients, or patients who have concomitant diseases that need to be treated such as cabbage or mitral valve, significant paravalent leak associated with the prior surgical valve, and also small surgical valve where severe mismatch is suspected. And top course, and just anatomically speaking, if they have high risk of coronary obstruction with tower and salver, they should also be considered for surgery as well. This is a valve and valve app that is now updated by uh, my colleague, Vinny Bapai, looking at the different ways to look at different surgical valve and the target implant positions and also the internal diameter and recommended transcaptor valves. I highly encourage you to download this and look at this in more detail. It's available for free on both Android and the Apple platform. You can see that each surgical has a different fluoroscopic signature. So it's important to know which is which when you do a cardiac catheterization and on CT. But also important, you need to know what the internal diameter is or the true internal diameter is or true ID. For example, on the left side, panel A, if you have porcine uh, mounted valve, the uh, true ID is going to be smaller than the stent ID versus a bovine pericardial valve mounted internally in panel B versus a panel C where it's also bovine pericardial valve but mounted externally uh, such that you can see the true ID and the stent ID would be both the same. So you can see that here in terms of the required information, typically require labeling of the surgical aortic valve, the coronary arteries, the aortic root, the ascending aorta dimensions, and finally, iliofemoral access as well. So how do we decide whether to do a balloon expandable or self-expanding valve in terms of TAVR and SAVR? So if it's a smaller surgical valve and we're not going to be fracturing, certainly self-expanding valve with a supraannular uh, leaflet would be beneficial in terms of hemodynamics. If you need coronary access, then a balloon experiment would be shorter frame and so it would be easier. Certainly in terms of pure AR in stainless surgical valve would be a challenging case regardless of which valve you use. Uh, like I said before, if you have balloon valve fracture BVF feasible, I think balloon experiment valve is a consideration. However, if it's not, then I think a self experiment would be better in terms of hemodynamics and less prosthesis patient mismatch. Now there's a question of, do you fracture before or after? Certainly there are still remain some controversy and no clear recommendations, but there are factors to consider whether to do it before or afterwards. There's certainly there are pros and cons of each option. I think the pros is that it's easier to implant a self-expanding valve, especially with less sizing mismatch if you fracture pre. However, there's some early evidence now if you fracture pre, it might not be as good hemodynamically as post. Uh, and also you can easy, more easily confirm the fracture uh, because you can visually see it on fluoroscopy. However, you can cause a QAI leading to hemodynamic collapse. Uh, but, you know, if you fracture afterwards, you do risk injuring potentially the transcaptor valve leaflet, and there might be risk of valve migration or embolization from 
for example, a very high implant and you fracture at the same time, or perhaps even undersizing relative to the post-fracture frame dimensions. So here's an, uh, how you evaluate core obstruction risk, what we call a one-two view. So in this left side, this is not the correct view. So correct view should be the right side where you actually overlap the two dots of commissural post uh, and the LAO cranial view, and then you do a selective one-two injection to determine the risk. And so this is an example of that. So you, for example, left side, you can see what I traced out in terms of the surgical valve commissural post. In the frame, you can see that there's plenty of room here to engage the coronary, so the risk will be likely to be low. But if you look at this particular case on the right side, you really don't have much sinus tubular junction with a very low left main of a surgical valve here. Once the tower is implanted, you can imagine the leaflet will extend where the dot, uh, hash yellow line is, and you can potentially cause coronary obstruction. The other reason for coronary obstruction, you can see that here is this wrist plane on the surgical valve. So you can see that if the valve to sinus tubular junction dimension is large enough, you can accommodate the diastolic flow from the coronary, then yes, you probably would be okay. However, if you have this distance, you can see by the asterisk being too close as shown at the bottom. So even with a shorter frame valve, with the valve and valve, you still can risk coronary obstruction. And so, as I mentioned before on the left side, these are the measurements that you should consider met, uh, determining on CT and also coronary angiography ahead of time. Now, we've also attempted to classify this aortic root anatomy in different ways. You can see that here on the uh, left figure that the type one root typically will be very generous. So a valve in valve certainly is not an issue, but once you go into type two and type three, depending on the anatomy of the aortic root and the distance between the surgical valve leaflets expanded relative to the STJ or coronaries, you could potentially risk coronary obstruction. And so it's very important to identify which root type it is. And you can see on the right side the algorithm to determine whether leaflet modification strategies such as basilica would be reasonable or safe. Now, one of the other factors that determine feasibility coronary access or redo tower, now we talk about tower and tower, is the whole concept of commissure alignment. And this topic has already been uh, published in, in a state-of-the-art paper, recently published in Jack Intervention. And so what commissure alignment means is that with surgical valve, we align the commissure post with the, with the surgical valve commissures. So there's no issue with coronary obstruction. But if you have transcaptor valve in tower, the commissure alignment can be random, at least until more recently when we have newer techniques and devices to address this issue. So you can see on the left side, the transcaptor valve commissure is aligned with the native commissure. So you have lots of cells open for coronary access and redo tower with leaflet modification. However, on the right side, you can see if a commissure post, especially these are wider posts, you can imagine a physical barrier facing one of the coronaries, reducing the chance of coronary access or redo tower. And you, more importantly, you can see that with the commissure post of these transcaptor valve, they're triangular in shape. They're not really taper in shape. So you need to see that this whole shaded blue area can potentially uh, erect it against the coronary office, making it harder to engage the coronary, but also to perform redo tower because this commissural post will become obstructed to the root anatomy. Even with leaflet modification, you can see that here, if you have a commissural post such as the top panel E and then also panel G with the uh, self-expanding valve, you can also obstruct the coronary even though the leaflet would have been split already. So you, all your hard work gone to waste and you still can cause coronary obstruction. So how we do uh, coronary in terms of commissural alignment with tower is at least with a self-expanding valve, we have three different valves here, Evolute, Acre, and Portico. You can actually line up the, the hat marker on the Evolute and then the commissural pose. You can see that horoscopically on this view. And then when you deploy the valve, one of the commissural poles should be facing the right side of the screen, as you see here on the right part of this image. And you know that you have good commissural alignment. Now, the other thing about commissural alignment is that you can may also reduce, improve the reduced tower visibility. Well, how? Well, you can actually modify the leaflets potentially to reduce the neoscript height. What I mean by that is you can see that here, if you have the leaflets plastered to the top of the valve, you can see the commissural height 
and the leaflet high or neoscript high rather can be quite tall. However, if you modify the leaflet because you have the ability to do so with commercial alignment, and you can actually then uh, lower the neoscript height to actually uh, much lower than anticipated. So the other thing about tavern and tavern visibility is determined not by just coming show alignment, but also sinotubular junction width because you won't want to seal off the aortic root completely with the neo skirt, the THV leaflet height, and also the implant depth of the first transcaptor valve. And you can see that here, that if you look at this uh, paper, just came out actually in Jack Intervention, a state-of-the-art review on redo tower, the number of steps that need to be followed in terms of looking at coronary obstruction risk in redo tower and also the sizing and position length consideration as well in terms of avoiding coronary obstruction. And you can see that here in terms of aortic root classification that we recently published, that even balloon expanded about a certain percentage of the patients may not be feasible for redo tower because of the frame rises above the STJ, especially you can see the type three root and you don't have enough room to clear the neo skirt uh, to be able to avoid coronary obstruction. So even for shorter frame bound, you still need to evaluate the feasibility by doing looking at the root classification. And you can see that here, this is a MedStar lower study paper looking at uh, redo tower feasibility. Again, similarly, there's a percentage of patients, uh, even though small, might not be feasible for redo tower. So the other thing that we talked about already is that this sinus sequestration by the neo square covering the entire aortic root above the sinus tubular junction causing sequestration and coronary obstruction, making redo tower not really feasible. And of course, if you look at this uh, paper here, if you do self-expanding valve and self-expanding valve, certainly the percentage of coronary obstruction is much higher than balloon expanding valve in a self-expanding valve, essentially. Now, what about coronary access after redo tower? Certainly, it's going to be much trickier because you can see that here, it depends on the commercial alignment of the first or second valve. If the first valve is a shorter valve and the coronary is above it, uh, your second valve, you should try to aim for commercial alignment to make the coronary access easier. However, if the first valve is a taller frame valve above the coronary, then you want to make sure that first valve has uh, commercial alignment because you might want to split the leaflet or modify the leaflet to enable the second valve, whether it's shorter or taller, to be able to be able to have clearance in terms of coronary access from the first transcaptor valve in terms of the leaflets themselves uh, being the barrier. And you can see that here, in fact, if you have coronary access that might be unfavorable with tower and tower, you might actually want to consider doing surgery first and then uh, tower and sour, and that coronary access should be simpler. So let me show you a, a quick case. This is a patient with a 20 sapien free uh, bursting parabolic leak. You can see a very small aortic root in terms of dimensions and low left main as well. Uh, patient initially had normal EF. However, you can see the valve is also degenerate with high gradient. And you can see that here with the initial uh, valve deployment. Uh, you can see actually it's not terrible, but you can see that here uh, on the screening TE, by the time it come back to us, uh, this was done outside hospital. It's a more severe PVL, and there's really no leaflet thrombosis. So, you know, we look at the CT, which we do routinely now. The valve is actually underexpanded. So you can ask yourself, can you just post dilate and actually fix the problem of the paraviral leak? However, one thing that to keep in mind is that these smaller valves, uh, they don't have much of the uh, co-optation reserve. So the transcaptor valve leaflet might actually become more pull ball open when you post dilate and call central AR. So you have to be ready to implant a second transcaptor valve if that happens. So you can see that here, it's only before post dilatation. You can see the severe PBL here, but after post dilatation, you can see certainly fluoroscopically, the sapien free is better expanded, but now, unfortunately, you now have central aortic regurgitation. And so because of that, you can also see the left main may be risking obstruction. We use a 23 evolute valve, so self-expanding for better hemodynamics to address the central AI. And we also protect the left main just in case. And you can see that here, certainly after the valve implantation, the left main remain open. We also post dilate as well to maximize the frame expansion of the evolute in terms of hemodynamics and durability, but also prevent any kind of frame to frame uh, leak. Uh, it's technically a parabolic leak, but it's between the two frames. And so there's no issue at all. You can see that here 
uh, the left main stem remains uh, patent. You can see that here we actually balloon the left main stem just in case as well. Patient has no uh, issue now, mild PBL uh, at most, no AI, good hemodynamics, and clinically improved. Sometimes you have to do more leaflet modification, and if you have a transcaptor valve, I think you're better off with what we would say the uh, balloon assisted basilica technique as well to be able to uh, improve the spray of the transcaptor leaflet for tower in tower. Now, you cannot do tower in tower. Tower expand is potentially risky operation. This is a paper we published last year looking at tower expand. You can see that the mortality rate at one year is quite high as well as stroke rate. And it doesn't matter whether it's balloon expandable or self-expanding valve. And you can see why tower expand is not like the first time a redo salver, because salver, you remove the native aortic valve leaflet, you debulk the annular alveolar calcification. There's a clean tissue plane to implant the surgical valve. But with redo salver, you, even then, you still can identify the tissue plane pretty easily, and there's no other adjacent cardiac structures involved. But with tower explant, you really have to look at three different factors. So the native aortic valve leaf is stuck to the transcaptor valve, so it's harder to extricate. The device in terms of stuck to the annulus LVOT or the aorta, so it's harder to define the tissue plane to separate the valve from the native anatomy. So you can risk cardiac injury and more extensive surgery, and so make it more complex. If it's a self-expanding tall transcaptor valve, you may need a higher air autonomy, a more distal aortic cannulation, so again, making the procedure more complex. And finally, if you have deep implant, you can impinge on the interventricular septum uh, or mitral valve needing mitral valve repair or BSD repair, making the surgery complex, not just isolated ABL anymore. So you can see that this example here from this paper uh, published on looking at aortic wound injury, membrane septal injury, uh, anterior leaflet uh, injury, and also aorta injury. Now, if you can't explant the actual valve itself, you can have this bailout where you just remove the leaflet because that's really what's creating a needle skirt and a tube graft obstructing the coronaries. And you can actually try to implant a transcaptor inside the bare frame uh, as a bailout. Certainly it's not ideal, but certainly if your patient's very high risk and you risk injuring the structures and prolonging the operation, this could be a potential uh, uh, hybrid procedure. But what I want to finally talk to everyone is about this whole life expectancy of the patient. If you have younger patient, like 60 to 70, you expect the valve should last at least 40 years because that's the life expectancy. But of course, we know that will not likely to happen. Uh, but as you get older, you can see that here, your life expectancy decreases and so the durability may not matter as much as if you were younger. So really have to think about how to get the patient to the mid eighties. And you can see this European Heart Journal review looking at uh, the sequencing of the patients for aortic valve reintervention. If you're really young, I would say the Ross procedure is probably the ideal procedure because you have your own native valve substituted. And however, if you are a little older, maybe tower is not unreasonable, but then you need to think about what the next procedure will be. Is it tower explant or redo tower? And finally, uh, you can see that here, uh, if you're older than 75, I don't think it will be may matter as much. So in summary, I think tower and salver is indicating high surgical risk patients, but will unlikely treat severe mismatch unless you can balloon valve fracture the surgical valve. Either way, you need meticulous floral and CT planning in terms of evaluating tapping staff or tapping tap feasibility, especially coronary obstruction risk. The whole style root anatomy in tower and tower should really consider salver as the first option, uh, particularly younger patients or those with severe mismatch that will be expected with tower. And finally, tower explant is riskier than first time or even redo salver. And so we need to consider patients' lifetime management of aortic valve disease in general. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention.